Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Terry James Gingrass, and this is Dr. G's ADHD Chat. This is a show trying to make the world safe for ADHDers. Uh, I thought I'd do something a little different this week. And for those of you who have been already been on the show, you know that I had a little technical glitch. Actually, kind of a big one. Somehow I had lost control of the whole process and couldn't stop it and restart it. And so just deleted the whole mess and I'm starting over again. So bear with me. Uh, the big thing about ADHD, well, there are a bunch of big things about it. One of the, I think the probably the most important thing for people with ADHD in their family system, however it is, whether they've got it themselves or their kids have it or whatever, is to keep remembering it's a neurologic condition. It's not a behavior disorder, okay? Looks like it sometimes, but it's not a behavior disorder. So the kinds of stuff you do for behavior disorders aren't going to work with a neurologic condition. And one of my pet peeves is most of my fellow psychologists who treat treat ADHD are doing it using behavior modification techniques, which are specifically not designed for neurologic conditions, okay? That's why it doesn't work. And you can be in therapy for years and years and years. Um, okay, that, that was not exactly where I was going to go with this, but popped into my head and I recently read a great article about that and it confirmed what I've known for years, which of course makes it a better article. If I disagreed with it, eh, we wouldn't be talking about it. Okay. Start off with, I got my PhD before there was ADD. And other than the nice alliterative effect there, what you basically, what that means is that I did not get coursework on ADHD uh, when I was in grad school, but then nobody else did either. Uh, ADHD wasn't particularly well recognized. Uh, research was minimal. Matter of fact, it wasn't even called attention deficit disorder until 1980. Okay. So the what they called it was hyperkinetic reaction of childhood, which, you know, can, you can tell from that name that it wasn't really well understood. Okay. This, the, you would assume that it means you have to be hyperactive and that you probably outgrow it when you get out of childhood. Neither of those things are true. You can have, all kinds of ADHD without being hyperactive and you don't outgrow it. Okay. If you had it when you were nine, you're going to have it when you're 90. Uh, and you best learn how to deal with it. Okay. So in addition to getting my PhD in 1980, well, actually I'd already, I had a child that was born in 79. And very rapidly, it became obvious to us that there was something a little different about this fella. Uh, I mean, he had peaks and valleys emotionally that were incredible. To, to He took incredible risks. I mean, he, as a kid, as an, even as an infant, he'd wander around the house in diapers. And he would, his, one of his favorite things to do was to, we had a rocker, a rocking chair, uh, one of the high back ones. Uh, and he he loved to climb up into the seat. He was just barely walking. And he would reach around with one hand, and then he'd just swing around, hanging off the back of the chair, feet about a foot off the ground, and just happier than, well, he was happy. <laughs> Let's put it that way. And uh, scared the heck out of me the first time I saw that. But then we noticed he did other things. I mean, he would use this, the, the drawers in the kitchen. He would pull them out 
and create a staircase so he could get up on the counter where the cookies were. Now, that was, I suppose, a creative solution to a problem. And the, um, I'm sorry, I'm getting a message here. Okay. Uh, we'll get to that later, Raymond or Ryan. Um, anyway, so my young, young man is doing all this stuff that's a little scary, very physically active, um, and absolutely no concern for his well-being. He just took risks, and it was a big deal, you know. Didn't bother him a bit. Uh, he's my only kid with numerous breaks and stuff like that. Uh, he got an infection in his knee from swimming in a polluted pond behind our house. Uh, he broke his collarbone because he was letting his buddy tow him on his, my son was on his skateboard and his buddy was on a bicycle with a ski rope towing, towing my son around the neighborhood. So the first thing we hear about that is, uh, uh, I've called the ambulance about your son, and we're like, whoop, whoop. okay. So I knew something was going on, but I didn't know what it was. And there were no good people at that time uh, to even do a, a reasonable evaluation. I had, I'm Air Force. I was in a training program. I had several um, colleagues, shall we say, who had postdocs in pediatrics. That is, they had spent an extra year studying, you know, the unique problems that children have. And I had them look at him, evaluate him. They couldn't come to any conclusion at all. Uh, but there's a, well, there is no way um, at that time that you could get a decent evaluation. So, Fortunately, one of the things you can do as a psychologist is you can train yourself, which is what I spent a lot of time doing, reading articles and going to conferences and all that stuff and learning about ADHD. Of course, that's not the real point here. The point is that nobody knew much about ADHD. But then after ADHD was starting to be identified, and then about six or seven years later, they changed it to ADHD from ADD. So there is no longer any such thing as ADD. Uh, it's all ADHD. Don't ask me. It's a bureaucratic decision. Anyway, so we've got these kiddos who are having all kinds of uh, problems and uh, not being very well treated. But one of the things I noticed is that most of them come in and their, IQ, their IQs are above average, okay? Uh, we know that both from formal evaluation and, and, you know, just interaction. This is a sharp cat, you know. And we found out that they um, hated school. They didn't have much self-confidence because they were getting criticized all the time. And so they felt like failures, you know, and... That's a hard one to work with if after once it's just pretty well established. But they had uh, basically just a lifetime of criticism for stuff they really couldn't control. It wasn't up to them uh, to have, be in control of their behavior all the time. They just couldn't do it. You just keep putting them in situations uh, that they can't handle. Uh, and, you know, that, well, that, that scars you, okay? Uh, and the educational system, it seemed, was also changing and emphasizing compliance and the ability to do busy work. You know, I mean, God, these kids are having three, four <clears throat> hours of homework every night, and it's just repetitive stuff, the same stuff over and over again. The research is not real good that homework does much of anything about learning, but hey, we were doing a heck of a lot of it. And these kids would, would hate the education system. Uh, they 
they feel bad about themselves and they at that time we didn't have good information to tell them other things other ways of thinking about stuff or anything really with good treatment methods and also i was i was in the air force and at that time we were seeing air force families <clears throat> so we'd see the kids and we'd see the wives and or the husbands depending and um it was a large a large part of them uh, were adhd and a lot of the fathers were adhd at Back, back in those days, it was uh, there were way fewer women in the Air Force than there are now. And, uh, but you've got a lot of kids who are bright, who are really sharp. You know, the Air Force does its own testing, and it puts you in, in the career field that uh, they think that that testing indicates you can handle. And so these guys are doing their tough stuff. I mean, they're repairing radars, radios, uh, jet engines, the most advanced aircraft in the world, and they're working on them and keeping them flying. Uh, but they just barely made it through high school. They just barely made it through high school. It's, uh, well, it is a bit amazing when I think about it that you know such a situation exists and continues to exist and the real problem is uh, they had absolutely no confidence in their ability to do well academically uh, the Air Force has a lot of programs that you can get into and get degrees and various things while you're on active duty but there are two things one is you have to have the confidence that you can handle it and two, you have to be in a, uh, a job that allows you time to go to class. Uh, and so we have a lot of kids who uh, couldn't get any advanced education. And here they are fixing, you know, fixing the F-35 one day, and they can't get a job uh, fixing a Piper Cub the next day. And uh, it, one of the sadder things, I think, was that we... You know, in the Air Force, it's not it's not a bad system if you have ADHD because the structure, uh, the support, and the regular monitoring of your performance uh, makes it easier to have ADHD and, and do pretty well. So we would have a lot of guys who were chief master sergeants. Uh, chief master sergeant, for those of you who aren't familiar with that, that's the top enlisted rank in the Air Force anyway. Uh, and the joke is that uh, the generals think they run the Air Force, but the chiefs actually have <laughs> do, do, do the bulk of the work. And that's, you know, basically true. They, they have to make stuff happen. Uh, and uh, when the people on the news are talking about uh, how the Russians don't have uh, a very re uh, uh, a military that's able to react quickly on the battlefield, uh, it's because of their enlisted force being not given any power. Okay, Air Force, uh, pretty much the whole entire um, U.S. military system, enlisted, senior enlisted guys, they have a lot of responsibility. But they also, I mean, they can do the work and they can get promoted. But once they get close to retirement time, they're in trouble because they don't typically have the certificates and licenses that they need to do the same job out in the civilian world that they do in the military. Now, I know the uh, Air Force, at least, has been trying to change that so that if you work on airframes uh, in the Air Force, you get certified uh, to be able to do it in civilian life. But Back when I was in, that that wasn't possible, and so you'd have some guy who was had a lot of responsibility in the Air Force, and he's getting close to retirement, and he's petrified because he doesn't know what the heck he can do out there. He know he doesn't have he, he knows he doesn't have the academic credentials he needs, uh, and he's not um, thinking that he could. It's possible for him to get them. 
you, know, you can. Well, depending on, on how you've done it, uh, you can have a lot of leave time left when you time to retire from the Air Force. And uh, most of us try to sell that back, but you can use that uh, to go to school um, and you're still getting paid at your, at your rank, whatever. Uh, so that's a possibility. But if you don't think you can do it, it's not a possibility. So all this manpower, all this brain power uh, is being wasted. Um, and it, um, it's just not, um, the way the system is set up, we are not, we are not the education system, uh, and basically most of jobs are not designed for people who think outside the box for original kind of thinkers. Um, but yeah, we need tons of those people. Uh, we need people who can see problems and come up with new solutions to those problems. Okay. Our conventional thinkers are great at keeping the current system running, but they aren't great at seeing changes that need to be made. So, uh, we need outside the box thinkers. Uh, and we need to change our educational system uh, so it produces few cubicle dwellers and more original thinkers. And it's not accidental, by the way, that 70 to 80% of all entrepreneurs have ADHD. So <laughs> um, I love that um, because I hang around with a lot of uh, entrepreneurs. <laughs> Okay, so that's what got me into it. You know, I looked at all these people and I, and I looked at all the waste uh, of their abilities uh, j just because the system's not set up right, just because the system's not set up uh, to um, allow them to use their strengths because uh, it focuses on their weaknesses. Okay, um, it's not a good system and uh, it's not a fair system and it's not good for our society in the long run. Okay, so that's how I got involved in ADHD. Um, you know, there, when you're we're raised in a very fairly conventional way, having an ADHD child introduces you to a whole bunch of things that you uh, really didn't want to have much to do with. Uh, you know, like, the principal's office, uh, in extreme cases, sometimes go to court. <laughs> it's just um, stuff that you probably were trying to avoid. But remember, these kids are brighter than average. They think outside the box. They're typically creatives. Um, end up with a lot of artists, musicians, uh, entertainers of various kinds. Um, in the, the that have ADHD, they're always coming out with some kind of a list, um, and it was uh, well. I'm starting to ramble a bit here, so we'll cut this short. That's how I got involved in ADHD, not because I had a couple of courses in grad school that were interesting, but because I kept running into ADHD on the job, uh, and then my home life. So. Um, I think it's really an important area that we need to make some big societal changes for. Okay, that's it for me. I'm Dr. Terry James Jimgrass, and this has been Dr. G's ADHD chat. The, the Dr. G's ADHD stays the same. The chat or room or whatever changes, they, I don't know exactly why or how, they're, but they're moving it around, so... I like chat better anyway. Okay, we will catch you next time. Thanks for watching. And um, my website is terryjingrassphd.com. Uh, and uh, if you, I, we have already gotten some uh, requests for information and stuff. Uh, the um, hmm, Okay, so I'll be answering these later on. 
And um, I will catch you on the flip-flop uh, next week. So thanks for watching.